You're listening to the QuickBook Reviews podcast. Brighten your day with a book. Hello, my fellow bookworms. This is Philippa from QuickBook Reviews, author interviews and book reviews. How are you doing today? Well, an update on the pantomime. We have our final ever rehearsal tonight. We had our dress and makeup rehearsal yesterday. It is improving. I sat and watched quite a bit of it yesterday because I'm only in a bit. I thought, well, it is it is improving. Soon, in a week's time, the pantomime will be over and I will be both sad that I'm not seeing everyone and mightily relieved that the hair pulling is over for the year. But never mind. Oh, and last week I recorded at the BBC. I don't know if you remember, but I was very nervous last week because I was about to go and do some recording at the BBC. I can confirm it went, it couldn't have gone better. I was really thrilled with it. And, but do you know, before I went in, I hadn't had any lunch. And this was, I was due there at half two. So got there early, went to a cafe, had a coffee and ordered a chocolate brownie. Because I thought, I can't eat a whole meal, but a bit of chocolate will give me the, the, the pip I need. And I couldn't do it. I had one mouthful of the chocolate brownie. I thought, no, I'm too nervous to eat the chocolate brownie. That's saying something, isn't it? That's not good. But what is good are the books I've got to talk to you about today. An interview that I've just finished recording and it it was such fun. I could have talked to this author for hours, but they wouldn't have wanted to talk to me for hours because they are a very, very, very busy person. So, Who are we featuring today? What books are we featuring today? The main book I'm talking to you about is called The Queen of Poisons by Robert Thorogood. And Robert is coming on to talk to me about this book. It's in the Marlowe Murder Club's mystery series. And of course, Robert is the original author, writer of The Death in Paradise series as well. We had a lot to talk about and it was just the loveliest of chats. I also want to talk to you about a book called In Memoriam by Alice Wynne. I'm very late to the party on that. I know a lot of you will be slapping your head saying, why is she only just getting around to this book? But better late than never. And then the other book I want to talk to you about is called The Cleaner by Mark Dawson. All winners today. We have no flops. We had a flop last week. We've got no flops this week. So let's get stuck in straight away to The Queen of Poison. Sorry for the noise, just moving the books out of the way. And let me tell you a little bit about this book. Geoffrey Lushington, Mayor of Marlow, dies suddenly during a town council meeting. But when traces of aconite, the Queen of Poisons, are found in his coffee cup, it's clear he was murdered. But who did it and why? Local sleuths Judy, Susie and Beck, a.k.a. the Marlowe Murder Club, are on hand to help the police investigate. As official civilian advisers, they have free reign to interview suspects and follow the evidence to their heart's content, which is perfect because Judith has no time for rules and standard procedures. But this case has them stumped. Who would want to kill the affable mayor? How did they do it? And is anyone else in danger? Let's go and talk to Robert now. It is my huge pleasure to welcome back to the podcast today, Robert Thorogood, whose latest fantastic book is called The Queen of Poisons. Robert, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. I loved this book. From the minute I started reading it, I had a smile on my face. I knew I was going to love to hear more of what the girls get up to and their exploits. It's You just keep pulling it out of the bag. So thank you. I was kind of you to say, I do find it funny that it's it's a murder book. And here we are started to talk about the smile I put on your face by killing people in Marlowe. But yeah, there's the genre in a nutshell. We kill people, but it makes you happy. Yeah, but we smile and we laugh about it yeah, exactly. to, to, to ourselves. For those who haven't read the book, can you sort of summarise it a little bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. So that the world of the book is the world of Marlowe, which is a small, well, it's not that small. It's a home counties town in Buckinghamshire, where I live. Previously, I created Death in Paradise, which is obviously filmed in the Caribbean, which is really hard for me to do research. So for my new series, I wanted to do something that's a little bit closer to home. 
I actually think I've done it a little bit too close to home because now everybody <laughs> thinks that I think that they're killers, which <laughs> I'll be honest, I think they are. And it's the story of Judith, Bex and Sudi. And these are sort of three amazing women, amateur sleuths. Judith is based on my grandmother and my great aunts and my mother and indeed a woman called Judith who helped teach me how to do cryptic crosswords. And it's they are these amateur sleuths in Marlowe and they bump into or uncover murders in each book and then they go and... Is it a spoiler to say they catch the killer? No, it's not a spoiler to say they absolutely do catch the killer in each one. Have I ruined it? Um, no, because there's so much to it. Well, did your did your air miles run out and you couldn't travel to the Caribbean anymore for your research and that's why absolutely, you just thought... Absolutely, that was it. They changed the rules on Avios. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a funny one, you know, because obviously Death and Paradise is, is amazing and it's it's been the thing where I learned the most about myself as a writer and I worked with the most incredible people. But it is really hard making a show on the other side of the world. You know, if there are any uh, any problems. In series one, for example, Sarah broke her leg after episode four. And if you look really carefully, if you were, were so minded to, you can see in episodes five through eight, she never stands up. She never walks because she's always behind a desk or use a body double. So that's not a problem. Wow. Or there's a tropical hurricane that comes in. Yeah. Suddenly you're dealing with these problems, but on the wrong side of the world in a very disadvantageous time zone. Because whenever you in the UK are trying to sort anything out, everyone in the Caribbean is in the bar drinking tea punches and being a little bit tipsy. So <laughs> after all of that for many, many years, I was just so thrilled to sort of just to move on to a world which was UK based, that was English or English, it was English in England. And to really sort of do, if Richard Poole was my Hercule Poirot, I wanted to sort of do what would a modern day Miss Marple look like? Mm. You know, how do you do Miss Marple nowadays? And so that was sort of what I was after. And I'm really pleased with how it's come out. And I'm thrilled that it's found an audience and amazed as we speak that it's about to come out as a television show as well. Yes. Can you tell us anything about that? Oh, I can tell you all about it. It's just whether you can get me to shut up about it. I came up with the idea for this in 2015, like eight years, no, nine years ago. We've had Christmas and I sold it to a TV company. It was called The Murder Club at that stage because I hadn't looked at where we were going to set it. And we tried to, you know, set it up with television companies and with channels and all of this. And it just completely fell apart. But I had a book deal at the time and I thought the best way of trying to sort of get this idea out there is I'm going to write it as a book because once you've written it as a book and your readers find it there's a, a sense well there's a sense of authorship isn't there to being an author mm -hmm. and it's a it's a way of of really you know selling what you hope this idea could be who these characters could be and then once the book landed and it did well of you know which blew me away I was absolutely thrilled to bits and remained thrilled to bits I then took it back to the TV companies trying to get itself as a TV show but the difference is is once you've got a book and they can read it they can see what it's about rather than guessing I set up with an amazing company called Monumental this ent ostensibly entirely all female production company and we're doing it with the drama channel here in the UK and with PBS in America and we have Sam Bond Samantha Bond playing the lead and Joe Martin and Cara Horgan and Natalie Jew, these amazing women. And we spent all of last summer filming in Marlowe, which was just the biggest busman's holiday there's ever been. Because <laughs> can you imagine? There's like a film set in your hometown and it's your film set and you get to go and walk to it. My commute was just, I just walked down the road and go, morning. And they'd go, oh, would you like a coffee? And I'd go, oh, I'd love a coffee. Thank you very much. So that was, that was the most extraordinary thing. This amazing team of people spending the summer making a TV show. And it comes out on March the... 8th, something like that, 2024, I think. And I'm very, very excited for the world to see what we did turning the book into a telly. Wow, that's just amazing. Do you, are you, have you got the golden ticket now when they meant someone mentions no. your name and you're pitching for something? Are they just snapping it up? No, I think the one, no, because there's the primacy is the idea and the idea has to be terrific. But I mean, I know we live in an, in an expanded world of streamers, you know, Netflix and Amazon and Disney Plus and da 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 We know there's a bigger world out there. But actually, if you were to list all of your favourite writers, Sally Wainwright comes in and pitches a show, right? You'd want to take her show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's 20, 30 amazing writers in Britain who demand and need to have a show every year. And I would be mortified if they didn't. And there's probably another 30 to 50 to 100 who do amazing shows. And then there are the youngsters coming through and there are the people who are washed up, who need a second chance. You know, 
there are so many brilliant writers who deserve shows and have ideas that deserve shows, but there aren't that many slots when you get down to it. So it's still, it doesn't matter who you are, whatever provenance you might have, you still have to pitch as though it's your first project. You have to make it as though it's your last. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's still just really, if I say tough, that that is is the right word, but I don't mean it's, it's, it's just, you just, it really matters. You know, and what's interesting about the world of books was that when I started writing novels, I got a sense from my publisher that my career as a novelist was going to be something that developed over time. They were interested in seeing how I could find my readers, how I can build sort of, no, brands, that's a horrible word, but, you know, my sense of what does Robert write, you know, genre-wise. And so each book is not its own thing, it's part of a bigger story. And I have found that so rewarding and so lovely because it sort of takes the pressure off. It's not do a good episode and if it's no good, you're out of here. And I have loved that. But what's wonderful about telly, you know, is that it's a team show. The fact that, you know, what you write is improved upon by the actors, by the designers, by by everyone, actually, frankly, by the locations, by the weather. I mean, who's the biggest star of Death and Paradise? It's the location. So I love all of that about telly. But, you know, it is a far more high stakes game because to write a book costs a publisher some thousands of pounds. To make a television show costs millions of pounds. And, you know, and that's the difference. Your books for me, and it sounds like I'm just trying to be a creep, but it, it's what strikes me are <laughs> it's a combination between great characters that I really care about, but super, super revelations. Is that some do the characters come first in each book or is it the who? They, well, it's it's a bit chicken and egg, and I'm really flattered and thrilled that you say that because I work very hard on certainly trying to do a fair play murder mystery. You know, I've alluded to Agatha Christie before. I am always was obsessive about her and remain quite obsessive about her. And I'm still trying to write. You know, when I write a, a murder mystery, I know it can't be done, but I'm trying to write something that would please Agatha Christie. I mean, it just can't be done. It's impossible, but that's the aspiration. And then when I fall short of that, I'm hoping that because my, you know, my reach extended beyond my whatever that, quotation is I can never remember but because I aimed so high that when I fall short of that I'm still at a reasonable height so I do try and make it so it's fairly clued that of course there are red herrings and misdirections and all of those sorts of things but there's always a moment just like in Death and Paradise where towards the end the detective in this case Judith and the gang will say ah we've worked out who the killer is and then it's really important to me that the reader at that stage has exactly the same information as the sleuths And so you can sort of close the book at that point and go, well, let's play a game of I wonder who the killer is. So that sort of fair play, sort of plotting and cluing matters to me. But truthfully, all books are about character. I mean, thinking about Agatha, Agatha, how presumptuous, Dame Agatha Christie, she was the most extraordinary creator of characters. And she would do it in such, with such brevity. She really reminds me, another person who does that is John le Carre. I mean, it's odd to compare John le Carre with Agatha Christie, but they would have this ability to just describe someone's shoes and you kind of got the whole character and and they're breezy, you know, because they don't overstay their welcome. You know, Agatha Christie books are really short. Some of the Tommy and Tuppence books are 50 something thousand words. I once counted them on a Kindle because I was so angry at how, well, Tommy and Tuppence mix back, but the good ones <laughs> are really, really good and they're short and she just breezily takes you through it. So that's all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to spin a yarn, make it fun, have lots of things that happen in it. I always want to have a chapter, you know, a cliffhanger at the end of a chapter because I sort of think there's nothing more exciting than going, oh, wow, I need to read what's next. And it's it's supposed to just be ideally this sort of joyous, fun, frivolous, in, you know, journey that you go on when you read it. That's what you're hoping for. And obviously you don't achieve that, but that's the aim. You do. And it seems like a really good place for me to ask you if you would read us a little bit from the book, from chapter one, the very beginning. Yes. And you can imagine how much I fussed over the opening sentence. Opening sentences are really, really hard. So here we go. This is how book three, The Queen of Poison, starts. Susie Harris was on a mission. She wasn't sure she'd be able to see it through. In fact, she knew the chance of failure was high, but she was going to give it her best shot. She was going to try to sit through a Marlowe Town Council planning meeting. Susie hated meetings, and the idea of a planning meeting seemed even more impossibly boring. But she'd recently come up with a ruse to make a financial killing, and she figured she'd need allies on the planning committee. 
So she decided to attend one of their meetings to discover who the key personalities were, how they made their decisions, and, most importantly, if any of them could be bullied into looking favourably on any application she later submitted. Fantastic. And what a planning ruse she had in mind. Another area that you cover in this book, Robert, is uh, the subject of podcasts, which uh, did make me smile as I was reading this. The the line, you know, uh, everyone's doing a podcast these days, which is true. Well, it is true. My wife is a broadcast journalist. So over the years, I've seen the development through her and her you know, experience of being at work of uh, radio being this, this, or you could, you know, appointment radio, you know, every day you tune into the arches, don't you? This is what we used to do. Thank you, Sunday yes. morning, you'd have the omnibus, <laughs> you know, it was an important part of your, of your week. And you'd get to the omnibus on a Sunday and realise that you'd listen to every episode during the week and go, oh, I've now I've got to sit through a long <laughs> recapping of what I already know. And then slowly people start doing podcasts. And what's amazing about podcasts is that it's democratic. You know, the fact that you and I can talk this morning and, you know, we've not had to hire enormous studios. We've not had to pay any enormous marketing budgets, all of these things. It, it is extraordinary. It's also quite funny, the fact that anyone can do a podcast. And of course, since lockdown, I mean, I'm not really being fair because, because since lockdown, since the pandemic, everyone's had to tap dance to work out either to how to make more money or how to get interest again because loads of people's careers stalled. You know, I know lots of actors who suddenly there, there weren't the jobs that they used to be. So it's totally understandable. But it is, I am winking at the fact that, yeah, everyone has a podcast. You know, the, the character who has a podcast is a sort of a wellness guru. So it was sort of trying to show that, you know, there is a lot to be said about wellness, of course, but the sort of person who goes into a podcast studio in their multi-million pound home and just broadcasts, presuming people will find it of interest. You know, so it was sort of suggesting that actually she's not very popular. She she should really be running a, a yoga session with all of her friends. But no, she's on her own behind a microphone. And without giving any plot spoilers away she also has a red light outside her room to show when she's recording I thought oh my goodness clearly I'm not professional enough I don't have a red light this is I need this well that's stolen from radio isn't yes. it whenever I go and see my wife I'm always uh, just so thrilled to see that they do have that light it's really really exciting can we talk about cozy crime because it's used a lot there are, you know there are a lot of books that are described as cozy crime and sometimes I have a problem with it because it's almost putting a book down it, it's not about it being cozy crime it's about it being just a great story a murder mystery but how do you feel about that label I am happy with the label because basically traditionally you know an English person talking about the word cozy doesn't feel very cool or sexy does it but in America cozy crime is this very very powerful and strong genre and people are really proud of it and I've learned over the years to realize that it's a really good description because what comes first when you read a you know one of my books or you know any other cozy crime story is you know you're safe you know that there's a tonal thing that's going to happen where there will be murders but and really dark things will happen. Agatha Christie, I would, you know, in lots of her books, they're not really cosy at all. They're just set in the 1920s. And so from our perspective, mm. they look like they're slightly cosy. You know, stories of incest, I would just, you know, I, I would worry about going that near. And Agatha Christie is very happy to, to really go to some very dark places. But yeah, you're saying to the reader, you know, take, for example, Death in Paradise, which is a cosy crime show. We realised without having ever written down any rules within four or five series on that, that we either, either knifed people to death or we shot them or we poisoned them, all of which are slightly at a distance murders. What we would never do would be was a hanging. You know, there are things that you just instinctively know are too real that would trigger too many actual responses to, to darkness and things that might be in people's lives or in you know, the, the wider community. So first of all, you're saying it's safe. And because of that, I do, and because the killer gets caught at the end, you know, I'm, you know, the, the joy is to say, how is the killer caught? Why is the killer caught? How is, you know, all of that is the fun of it. You, you know, every Agatha Christie, give or take, unless a woman commits murder, in which case she's quite often allowed to get in a car and drive herself off a cliff to her own suicide. <laughs> but generally the killer is always caught and brought to justice. So that's what Cozy says. And I'm very happy to, you know, to, to em embrace that. I mean, I always smile. Jeffrey Deaver's first book, The Bone Collector, yep. is an Agatha Christie story. It re I, I, I was reading it because I thought, oh, everyone's saying this really shocking, dark, macabre book, all of which is true. It's a horrible, horrible story. Turns out at the end, it's an Agatha Christie. 
it's a fair play who done it and and you sort of look at that and go you know what that's quite close to a cozy crime i know having somebody strip someone of their skin and all of those things yeah. is not cozy at all so tonally it's wrong yeah. but it is a fair play murder mystery mm-hmm. and the revelation of the killer at the end is one of the most thrilling mm-hmm. i've ever come across in any of you know the thriller genre that i've read so yeah so it's not jeffrey diva when you're doing cozy crime even though they're sort of similar in how they're they're constructed but on the other hand it you know it's it's not always agatha christie it's safer in america i remember i was up for an edgar award i was absolutely thrilled to bits i couldn't believe i mean oh god i couldn't believe it so i went to new york and i discovered at the award ceremony that there were quite a few in my genre there were quite a few crime fighting cats and so there i found myself going "Mm, okay so i am cat detective adjacent which feels a bit too close to crime solving cats if i'm entirely honest but you know but that's the genre you know it's we're a broad <laughs> check we have crime fighting cats but also you know somebody pitched to me the other day we were i was talking to tom hindle who's written yeah. some fabulous books the yeah. latest uh, murder on lake garda it's the sunday times bestseller and he was talking about a an idea he'd had for a cocktail you know these mixologists these people who can make cocktails and he had this idea i, I can't i can't pitch it so i don't want to spoil it but about this person who solves crime and i went yeah and you'll obviously put in the cocktail recipes and he went would i and i went yeah because we can solve the crime and drink the drink so yeah so who am i to complain about crime solving cats <laughs> cocktail yeah you got me on that one yeah exactly <laughs> we love learning about judith and susie and bex but is it hard because you know there's a series so you want to tell us lots about them in each book but you don't want to tell us so much that you don't have enough for the next book yeah that is that's it's a very i can't give you an interesting answer to that but that is an interesting technical challenge for the writer when you're developing a series you're trying to show different facets and actually i'm at the moment writing book four and i have a contract for five books and maybe i'll write some more later i don't know because you know the last thing you say when you meet your publisher is is well will you renew my contract so because i was very unsuccessful for many years before i was allowed to actually write and get paid to write i'm not presuming that there will be any more after book five so i'm thinking of books four and five as a pair so although i don't know the story of book five i know what we're going to do what we hold if only it was we i know what i'm going to do with the women with my main heroes through books four and five because I didn't want to write four and then use up all of the stuff that would be in five mm-hmm. and similarly I didn't want to you know but it's just I, I wanted to although each story will be completely separate there's there are things I'm going to do in five that I'm beginning to allude to in fours but it's but it's, it's an interesting challenge there's the biggest challenge you know a tv episode is 60 minutes of an audience's time and you bring the characters back, you kill someone, you catch them at the end, you have a drink in Catherine's bar, you have a scene with Harry the Lizard. There are all of these fun things you do and it takes 60 minutes and it's gone. With a book series, you know, each book is closer to 80,000 words than not. So over five books, what are five rates? 400,000 words. That's a lot of words to spend with characters and try and give them space to breathe and to change a little bit, but not so much that they, you know, stop being the fun people that you want them to be. That's a really enjoyable, slightly terrifying, I mean, I think, well, 400,000 words, that's a lot of words, isn't it? It's slightly terrifying, but it's, it's amazing to have a canvas that enormous to work with when you're used to just trying to tell a story in 60 minutes in and out. I'm sure you're aware of this, Robert, but my family and lots of families and people sitting watching Death in Paradise, we sit there and we have a game that within the first five minutes, you have to have decided who's about to be killed and who is going to kill them. <laughs> and I, I I, do like to say I have quite a good record of guessing, but your books, I can never guess who the murderer is. I'm oh. always surprised by that. That's interesting. Well, I'll tell you about that. There's, it's, oh, that's lovely that you would say that. Again, because Death and Paradise is fair play, by the time the killer happens, again, it's all to do with 60 minutes. And, you know, the American version, the, the version that we send out around the world is 52 minutes long because it has to have eight minutes worth of adverts. And if you're ever watching Death wow. and Paradise in the UK, please watch it on BBC iPlayer because they're 60 minute episodes. And if you watch it on Netflix, they're 52 minute episodes. So we have to kind of show you everyone and then kill someone because we can introduce characters later on, but by George, they've got to earn their place because time is the currency that you have the 
the least amount of money of that doesn't really work but you know what I mean Mm -hmm. whereas in a book you do have time to introduce new characters as you go along you have time to introduce new murders and again talking about those 400,000 words over five books which you know hopefully there'll be more but I'm not presuming that's a lot of space in which to explore characters and explore telling stories with a different rhythm So, you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed doing is starting off with, say, in book three, we have a murder. It's the the mayor is murdered. I'll tell you what is good is that because I come from telly, I don't half kill people quickly. I had a lovely (laughs) chat with Faith Martin last week and she's wonderful and writes brilliant books. And she was talking about the joy she has when she reads a book, knowing that she gets to know everyone and then maybe a third of the way through, a bit later, their murder happens. I think that's really, really respectable as a way of writing a murder mystery, whereas I'm just a terrible tart. You know, (laughs) page one, here's a group of people. Page 15, oh no, one of them dead. But having killed Jeffrey in the planning meeting, so the chapter that I started reading from, by the end of it, Jeffrey is dead, then... As the story progresses, I really enjoy trying to expand it. So it starts off being about this group of people in a room. And then you find out a bit more about who they are and who their families are and who their jobs are. And you meet more people. So it's sort of a rolling stone gathering moss. And again, you can't really do that in a telly. But because you've got a rolling stone gathering moss, it also allows you to smuggle in people and information and clues. The greatest gift that I can give to anyone trying to plot a novel murder mysteries i think which agatha christie was an absolute past master at is it takes long to read i mean it doesn't because we're we will hoover up a book but in theory a book takes days it takes weeks to read so the best tip is is if you need two bits of information to be put together in order to work out who the killer was just have one in chapter one and one in chapter 40 and then technically you have played fair but I defy anyone <laughs> yeah. to remember those two bits of information separated by maybe a month, six weeks between when you read the first one and read the second. My goodness. But then I would just say briefly with the books where the person is killed off much later, you've got to know that victim up to the point they're murdered. But then you don't tend to find out as much about them after that. Whereas with your books, yes, you kill them off early on, but we're still learning about the character throughout the whole book. So Yes, and what I think you also get is you get unreliable narrators because you'll have four or five, five or six people saying, well, in the case of Geoffrey Lushington, who's the mellifluous mayor of Marlow, who I kill, they'll all be saying, oh, he was like this, he was like that. But the reader... It's a bit like traitors, isn't it? The reader knows that (laughs) at least one of those people giving testimony is a killer and is not 100% faithful. Love it. So that's a bonus that you get. But uh, with book four at the moment, what am I doing for book four? I never remember. I'm writing it at the moment. Oh, there's a very flamboyant person who's killed. And because he's killed very early on, calm d'habitude, um... I will, I'm not struggling because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crack the nut. But the challenge in this book is to really access how flamboyant he was because he's dead before the story starts. So when the testimony comes in, people saying, oh, he was hugely flamboyant. He had amazing clothes and these are the things he did. It's all a bit past tense. It's all a bit passive, you know, in the passive mm. voice, as the clip art would say to us, as the paperclip would say to us. Whereas if he'd been alive in a Faith Martin novel for longer we could have seen him actively be flamboyant Mm. so there's pros and cons to both and the truth is is that luckily we get faith martin books so there's a way of telling stories like that too well robert we come to the last question which is the most crucial one on this podcast so please prepare yourself and it is what biscuit was powering the writing of the queen of poisons what is your biscuit of choice (laughs) well it's it is the only question and it is something that i struggle with on a daily basis but this is not a therapy session i so in the morning i have one coffee because i need a coffee to wake up because i'm 52 and i just cannot wake up otherwise however by about lunchtime ish and i'm beginning to flag i need a cup of tea and i'm allowed two cups of tea a day so there i place them a bit like jokers in some sort of terrible game show where you're a writer all day i'll have one maybe sort of just after lunch and then one about three o'clock ish after i've got back from the dog walk and i eat a pep And the problem is, is there is no cup of tea ever invented that isn't improved by literally any biscuit. So if I'm being honest, it is a hobnob. It's a chocolate hobnob. And I I was thinking about it only yesterday. I'll open a packet and I'll take two. But you know that awful feeling as you go to your desk with a cup of tea and two biscuits and you're just saying to yourself, I'll be going back for three more (laughs) in about two minutes. 
and you go back for three more and you've had five now and you're going, yeah, but if I ate the whole packet, no one would even know that I had even one, <laughs> you know. So I have a very bad relationship with biscuits and you can tell where I am in my writing process by how fat I am because generally at the beginning of the process, I'm reasonably spelt. But for example, now in February, where I'm really up against it for delivering the new book, it's mostly biscuit pans. Yeah, I'm mostly biscuit now. Well, Robert, this might be a revelation for you, but it's something I only learned through this podcast and another author. Do you know the best way to store your chocolate hobnobs is the freezer and eat them straight from the freezer? It's a game changer. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Well, look, I can give you my hobnob anecdote, anecdote, which is that uh, when hobnobs came out, they did not have that little that little red tape near the top that you peels like the packet of a cigarette packet, you know, so that you could pull the cellophane off. You had to cut it, it said cut with a knife. And I wrote to McVitie's and I said, could you please change the hobnob design because this is too important for me. So it has the little cellophane thing so that we can peel it off and then the top will pop off. And lo and behold, they wrote back, including a packet of hobnobs. I mean, a, you know, a voucher for a packet of hobnobs and said, yes, we are planning to make that change. Thank you very much for your suggestion. Now, it's possible that they were going to make the change anyway. But I've always claimed since then that I improved the design of hobnobs. So a bit of a cell phone there. <laughs> I mean, I knew we were going to be discussing great books, but I didn't know we were going to be discussing yeah, sure, sure. even more crucial Headline things. Headline news, about. stop the press. It truly is. And what a wonderful way to finish. It's just great to talk to you and hear more about the Queen of Poisons. Robert Thorogood, thank you so much. Thank you, Philip. It's been lovely talking to you. Coming up, two more book reviews. So let's get stuck into the book reviews. The first book I want to talk to you about is called In Memoriam by Alice Wynne. Now, I tried to listen to this last year, I didn't say last week, last year as an audiobook, and I didn't get on with it. But then Derek, who is a member of our Quick Book Reviews Facebook group and whose book choices and book views I trust and, and match mine a lot, said he really enjoyed it. So I think it just caught me on the wrong time. However, I had a book, I had a limited edition copy of this and I thought I'm going to sit down and read it. Now, in my limited edition copy of the book, I do not have a blurb to read to you. So prepare yourself, Philip is going to make up her own blurb. This is a book set in World War II. Well, it's at the beginning of World War II. Boys are in a boarding school and one by one, um, they reach an age where they can go and fight in the war. It's about friendships. It's about love, unrequited love, requited love. It's about Oh, it gives you this view of the fighting that I had never, I'd never seen the war portrayed in this way. The trenches, the relentlessness about it, how these boys felt going up. Oh, I, I thought it was an incredible book, incredible story. It's gut wrenching. I've I've heard that a lot of people sobbed as they read it. I didn't cry, and I was disappointed because you know there are some times when you feel like a good cry, when it just it's very cathartic to have a good cry. And I didn't cry with this, but I think because of all that's going on, pantomime and recording and everything, I didn't sit and immerse myself. I didn't give it enough time. So I was reading it in lots of little bits, which normally would put me off a book altogether, but I just kept reading for this one. But I don't know if that affected my emotional connection. I don't know. It's a brilliant book. If you like books, I think you're going to like love this one. I haven't heard of anyone not enjoying it so far. I thought very good. Excellent. And even, this is a, yes, apropos of nothing, Rob Beckett... <laughs> This is really a fair nothing. Rob Beckett's wife has an Instagram account and she has started book, doing book reviews on that Lou Beckett. And she gave In Memoriam a 10 out of 10. And it was actually, I've got to be honest, when she gave it 10 out of 10, it just reminded me that I've got, I had this special edition and that I should jolly well read it. So there you go. The power of the socials. Who Who knew? The final book is The Cleaner by Mark Dawson. Now, we've had Mark on previously talking about a different series, but this is the start of one of his, I think, biggest series. So I thought, I've, I'm going to read it. Let's find out. And the it's about this guy, John Milton, 
And the blurb is very simple. John Milton is the man the government call when they want a problem to vanish. But what happens when he's the one that needs to disappear? I thought it was, I thought it was great. It was a really easy read, but there's a lot of sort of grime and nastiness to it as well. I read it thinking, I'm sure I've read this before, but I haven't. I went through all my records and I haven't, but his books are just, I just get immersed straight into them and I feel like I know the characters really quickly. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was really good. And then, yeah, the tagline, MI6 created him, now they want him dead. There we go. So those are the books. I think I've covered enough. I just, yeah, I hope there's been a good selection for you and I'll be back again next week. In the meantime, just look after yourselves and I'll talk to you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Quick Book Reviews podcast. That's enough books, said no one, ever. See you again soon.